see everybody today. Welcome home. If you guys need a Bible, I want to encourage you to download our app. You can uh, watch the service, and uh, there's a Bible on there. We're in Jonah chapter 4 today, and uh, while you're turning to Jonah chapter 4, I just want to let you know that we have a night of hope coming up this Friday night. So at 7 o'clock, we're going to be on our field. There's no a limit to the number of people that can come. How many of you were with us on the last night of hope? Raise your hand. It's an amazing time. God really moves. So I want to encourage you guys, uh, just roll on down here. Bring your lawn chair or your blanket. Bring some water and uh, bring your desire to worship God. Good to see everybody. Let's all stand together as we wrap up Jonah. How are we doing today? That felt good, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, man. All right, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. Why did he run? Well, here it is. For I know that he criticizes God. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. Slow to anger, can you imagine being mad at this? Slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Mr. Drama, <laughs> right? And verse 4, God reasons with them. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? What does Jonah say? He just ignores God. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city. There he made a sh for himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. What do you think he was hoping for? And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So, jo so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head, probably because he was bald, <laughs> so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry angry even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you've not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. Father, we pray that you would give us your heart God, we confess that sometimes, sometimes we're just like Jonah. God, we can be overdramatic. Uh, we can walk in disobedience. We can be more concerned about the, the simple cares of life and having our needs met than the souls of the lost around us. And God, we just asked you to bring revival in that song. We asked you to awaken your church. We asked you to awaken a city. And God, we don't want to just sing that heartlessly. God, we don't want to say it in praise filled with emotion and yet not really align our behavior and our attitude to your will. And so, Father, we pray that you would bring revival right here, right now, first and foremost. God, in our lives, in our families, in this church. God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit. We long for that, God. We do desire it. But God, I pray that you would lead us more deeply into our own revival. And then God, as you bring that, it would spread from there. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Over the last five months, God, you have not failed us. And together we give you all of the praise. You alone, Lord, are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat today. <clears throat> a long time ago when I just started preaching, a wise pastor said to me, Derek, never forget, you're only as good as your last sermon. 
And if, that, if that's true, you know, I think Jonah's good to go. If this book ended at chapter 3, Jonah would be memorialized as one of the greatest prophets ever. I mean, just think about the simplicity of the message that he preached with such astounding results. But you know, with God, it's not just about the sermon that's preached, it's about the attitude that it's preached with. And Jonah's kind of positioned himself like the prodigal son's elder brother. He's present for the great move of God's spirit. He's present for the outpouring of the love of God, and yet he's positioned himself in a seat of judgment. He might be present, but he is not engaged. He might be present, but he is not really desiring what it is that God had just done. In fact, Jonah was more interested in justice than he was salvation. Or let me just say it a different way. Jonah was more interested in God's judgment than he was in seeing God's mercy. And, you know, the, the root of this is exposed in the fourth chapter of this book. And at the end of the day, as you read this, you see that Jonah knew that God's love was the single most powerful force in the universe, powerful enough to save a city and transform a culture. He knew this. This was what had caused him to be reticent or reluctant to even go to Nineveh in the first place because he was familiar with what it was that God was able to do. And, you know, in a way, it's just so mind-blowing to see because we pray for God to do things like this all the time. And so to read chapter 4 and discover that Jonah was not only displeased, but he was angry as God had moved, as God had blessed, as God had miracled, it's not a word, but I'm using it anyway, because that's what he did. God miracled this city. God miracled the people of the city. God miracled this king. I mean, there was this radical thing that God had done, and Jonah is in the opposite position of where we think we would be. This is why chapter 4 is so important. You know, I think a lot of focus gets put on the first three chapters, and rightfully so, don't get me wrong, but chapter four is the most important reminder, and chapter four teaches us that God's stubborn love always wins. Aren't you thankful for that today? God's stubborn love always wins. It wins in Jonah's life. It wins in the life of the Israelites, and it also won in Nineveh. I just want you to think about a couple of things today, and I think these are just so important for us, especially right now with what we're dealing with in our country. First, we see that God's love wins even when his prophet was being dramatic. God's love won even when the prophet was being dramatic. You know, for Jonah, God's love was the problem. Like, can you actually imagine being in a place where you have a problem with the love of God? And at the end of the day, Jonah knew exactly what it was that God was going to do. He argues with God. I mean, there's this outpouring of God's spirit, this radical transformation in a culture, in a city. And this is what Jonah says, man, I I knew you would do this. I know your character, not just by revelation, but by personal experience, He counted on the fact that God was going to do a work because he knew. You know, God gave, Jonah's words can be traced all the way back to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, where God gave to Moses a self-disclosure. God describes himself to Moses. Remember, Moses was longing to see the glory of God. And as God revealed that glory, he gave this self-disclosure where he said, the Lord The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Aren't you thankful today for that? Aren't you thankful that's who he is? Aren't you grateful that that is what he does? Now look, why was it that Jonah was so concerned about this? Some commentators say he was concerned about his own reputation, Like, you can hear Jonah thinking this, what will people think? Like, if I'm the guy that goes to Nineveh, you know, that that culture that has so impacted the people that I love, if I'm the guy that goes and reaches out to them and bears a message and God does a work, that won't be good for my reputation. 
Like, I'm not sure that I'm really prepared to handle the PR of that. And I think in some ways it's possible that Jonah didn't want to connect himself with a mighty move of God with the people that would somehow damage his reputation. You know, if your reputation is being dragged through the mud on earth that it, so that it can be esteemed in heaven, it's worth it. If God's, let me say it a different way, if God's glory means your humbling, it is worth it. So how low are you willing to go? How low are you willing to go? Who are you willing to reach with the gospel? Who are you not willing to reach with the gospel? Let me just say it a different way then. How low did Jesus go for you? What amount of shame was he willing to experience in his condescension so that you could receive the gospel and be made a child of God? The Bible says in Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. Now this is the condescension that we're talking about from the glory of heaven. And then watch this, every step a little bit lower, right? Every step a little lower, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. I think we should have, there we go. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Look, in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, what did he choose to do for you? He chose to make himself of no reputation. And every step that he took was just a little bit lower. He was willing, the son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, was willing to humble himself so that you could experience the forgiveness of sin, so that you could know the love of God. And Paul does not just present this as a theological reality. It is a theological reality, but he presents it as more than that. He presents it as, as an example to follow. Look, let this mind be in you. Let this way of thinking be in you. Let this attitude, which for sure was not in the heart of Jonah, let this attitude be in you. Let this willingness be in you to follow the example, to be willing to humble yourself, to be willing to even have your reputation trodden if, if it means others might know the love of God. You know, sometimes we have that same disposition that Jonah does, you know, we're more dramatic in our relationship with God than useful, and yet even in the midst of that, God chooses to love us. Aren't you thankful for that today? The second thing, that's right, the second thing is this, God's love won even when his prophet was being disobedient. So Jonah wasn't just dramatic, but he was also being disobedient. And you know, as you read this story, it's just so interesting, the willingness of God to reason with this wayward prophet and, you know, we'll see this in just a second, but he asks the same question twice. Is it right? The first time he asks it, he doesn't even get an answer. He does not even get an answer from Jonah. Like, how many times have you, like, begged God to speak to you? God, I need to hear your voice. God, I want that revelation. And, and here, maybe Jonah just seemed to be so accustomed to getting the revelation of God that he was willing to ignore it. Look, I hate it when people, when I'm talking to somebody and they just turn their back and walk away, not good, not good. I mean, just not a good thing. And can you imagine, I mean, God's got every right to incinerate this prophet right where he is standing. And yet he is so patient, so patient with his wayward prophet. But for the second time, Jonah abandons his post. He didn't want to celebrate or even see the work of God. And yet, as you read the story, what you discover is that God still loved him by caring for him. God still loved him, even when he abandoned his post, even when he disregarded the revelation of God, even when he was willing to be un he was unwilling to be reasonable. When God was willing to be reasonable, what did God do? God still blessed him. God still provided for him. God still cared for him. How many times have you still been blessed? How many times have you still been blessed? Now, don't get me wrong. Today, I'm not saying that 
we ever are in a place where we deserve the blessings of God, because for sure we don't. But you know, those times when you really don't deserve his blessings? You had one of those in your life? Maybe one, maybe two? More? When you really didn't deserve it? You know, when, when, you're, when you were throwing the fit, when you were being dramatic, when you were walking in disobedience, and God still in that space, in that spot, he still blessed you. Aren't you thankful for him today? Aren't you grateful? He's, now look, I'm not advocating uh, ungodliness or disobedience and saying, hey, God's still going to bless you anyway. For sure, that's not the message. That's licentiousness. That's taking grace for granted. But the reality is that God still blesses us even in the midst of our struggle. It is the kindness of God that draws us to repentance. It's in that spot that God still loves us, that, that we're humbled and we're broken and we're like, really, 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 God? I mean, I just can't believe you're still so good to me. And we raise the white flag of surrender and yield our lives. Not because he's demonstrated his justice, but because he's demonstrated his love. After all of this, God still cared for the needs of his prophet. Psalm 63 and 3 says this, because of your loving kindness, this by the way is David, he's in the wilderness fleeing Saul when he writes this, because your loving kindness is better than life. Can you say that today? My lips shall praise you, thus I will bless you while I live, I will lift up my hands in your name. <laughs> That's so, just hang on to that. That's so good. Can, can you lift up your hands in his name today? Can you give him praise? Yeah, but pastor, pandemic. Pastor, pandemic. Pastor, social unrest. Pastor, social distancing. Pastor, craziness at Walmart. Pastor, road rage. I'm, I'm not saying call me pastor road rage. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying that's what you're dealing with. You're like, whoa, man, I am overwhelmed. Like my needle has hit the red mark. I'm at the high water mark. I can't take any more. Hey, where do you go? You go to the loving kindnesses of God. I'm not focused on the pandemic or the social unrest. I know they're all things that need to be dealt with, but the thing I know the most is that God's loving kindness is better than life itself. And so check this out. David makes the choice. David makes a decision. What is his decision? These lips, these lips, they're not going to be lips of division. They're not going to be lips of conflict. They're not going to be lips of complaining. Go back to the verse. They're not going to be lips of drama. These lips are going to be dedicated. They're going to be consecrated to giving you praise. And these lungs, look, while I live, while I have breath, while I'm able to breathe in and breathe out, these lungs are going to be used to bless your name, to bless your name. And these hands, right? I mean, David's just, he's just so fully engaged in worship. His lips, his lungs, and then he says, these hands, these hands are going to be dedicated. These hands are going to be purposed for one thing, to lift them up and to give you the praise that you deserve, to exalt the name of God. You know, it is his loving kindness. Maybe you're walking through it. Uh, a challenging time right now, and, and even in your relationship with God, you know you've not been being the disciple that God desires you to be. Let the loving kindness of God soften your heart. Let his relentless, stubborn love for you bring you to a place of surrender so that completely, wholly, you are loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Let the love of God win in your life today. The third and final thing today that I see here is maybe the most important thing. My favorite verse in these four chapters is verse 11 because what we discover is that God's love won in the biggest culture transformation that the world has ever seen. God's love, and I know that we're so familiar with the story, sometimes it's like, well, blah, 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 you know, I know how it goes, but I want you to think about this. 
God's love won in one of the biggest culture transformations the world has ever seen. You know, God addresses his prophet, his dramatic, disobedient prophet, with the same question twice. By the way, if if God ever hits you up twice with the same question or the same statement, be smart enough to get it, okay? And and, and this this is the deal, because sometimes we have rocks in our heads, and we need that reiteration. But he says, is it right for you to be angry the first time? Reasoning with this prophet, is it right for you to be angry? And then again in verse 9, he says, is it right for you to be angry now again, not about the outpouring on Nineveh, but about the plant? About the plant. What is God saying here? I mean, God for sure is not posing the question as a matter of opinion. He's not saying to Jonah, well, I'm a little confused on this issue. I, you know, don't really know how humans operate in difficult circumstances, so maybe you can help me out. Is it right? Is it okay? I mean, God's not posing this as a, as a, a question that needs to be answered. It's a rhetorical question. So let me just frame it as a statement. God is saying to Jonah, hey, this is not right. This is not right. It is not right that You care more for a plant than you do people. This is not right that you don't care about the salvation of these souls. Jonah, your attitude is off. Your attitude is misaligned. And and listen, for sure, not only was it misaligned, but because it was misaligned, Jonah missed out. Jonah missed out on one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen. It was so disproportionate in Jonah's life that he cared more about his small needs being met than he cared about the salvation of people. You know, not only that, but he was willing to call a city to repentance, but he was unwilling to repent himself. Now, that's a, that's a big deal. What a huge responsibility we have as the people of God to make sure our own lives are aligned with the message that we preach. You know, if I, maybe if, if you or I were there at the time and we knew this was going to be the way it was going to roll out, we would have said to Jonah, hey, newsflash, Jonah, God's love isn't the problem, it's the solution, right? I mean, because this is how chapter four starts. He's like, man, I knew you were going to do this. I knew it was going to be love, love, love with you. And he kind of felt that the love of God was the problem. And, you know, as we know the whole story, if we were present with Jonah, we would have said to him, hey, Jonah, wake up. Dude, wake up. The love of God is not the problem. It's the solution. Right? At home, right? (laughs) Right? Right? right. Hey, listen, are we sure? Are we sure about that? Are we really sure about that? You know, because, because Christians get caught up on all sorts of stuff, don't we? And, and we lose sight. We lose sight of the love of God and what's most important. We get caught up in politics. I'm not saying politics are important. But when they become more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got a problem. We get caught up in issues. I'm not saying that there aren't important issues. But when it becomes more important than the issue, it's a problem. We get caught up in our own causes, right? We planted our flag on something. We've drawn a line in the sand on a cause. And it means everything to us. And in it meaning everything to us. The gospel of Christ and the saving of souls has taken a lower seat in the house of our heart. Look, we get caught up. Check this one out. We get caught up in groupthink. We get caught up in groupthink, and pretty soon, everybody around us that we've aligned ourselves is now doing the thinking for us, doing the discerning for us, dictating what it is that we do in our life. We've, we've abdicated our responsibility to be individuals who are in the word of God for ourselves. Look, I think it's easy for us to say that the salvation of souls matters most, but I'm just going to tell you, I see a lot of misaligned priorities in the body of Christ right now. 
And the, con- the concern for me is this, that in all of that, we're going to miss something. We're going to miss something. You know, the Jesus movement was a powerful move of God's Holy Spirit uh, across our country. And it went, beyond, it, it went beyond our beaches. It was a worldwide move of God. But you know, there were churches that missed it. And as you talk to those people that were there, they would say to you, well, the churches that missed it were so caught up in the politics of Vietnam. Or they would say they had such a disdain for the hippies that they weren't even open to a move of God's Holy Spirit. Little did they know the people group they were disdaining was the people group that God was going to reach. Look, think, I, I want you to think about that because I believe we're at that same crossroads. I believe we're at that same crossroads. Nineveh proves that a city and a culture can change in a day. Do you believe that today? Nineveh proves, it is, it is exhibit A. It proves that a city and a culture can change in a day. And I'm saying to you, the worst city. I'm saying to you, the worst culture. I'm saying to you, the worst people. I get people all the time, well, pastor, you know, there's no hope for America. There's no hope for America. Like America is just so far gone that it, you know, it's just ripe for justice. And really, there's, there's no space anymore for God to do another work. And I'm like, Nineveh. I just, I just got one word. And that's all I need. Nineveh, if God can change a city and a culture like Nineveh in a single day, can't God do the same thing with America? So interesting, as the Pharisees were asking for a sign uh, for Jesus to do that would prove that he was the Messiah, he said there's only one sign, and that's the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days, three nights, so also will the Son of God be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And all of that looking forward to the resurrection. And look, I think, I think that if you just like look beyond the obvious, Jesus is conveying a principle of God that he is the one who is able to turn death to life. Our God is able to do that. And he is the only one that can do that. The stone was rolled on the tomb. The the hope of the disciples was lost on that Sabbath until they went to the tomb and the stone was rolled away. And the angel said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is risen. And, And this is what God loves to do. God loves to take the impossible in the human eyes and work the miracle. God wants to take the things that are dead and he wants to bring them to life. And I'm saying to you today, God wants to do that now. You know, hey, pastor, what is God doing? What is God doing? What is God doing? Well, I'll tell you what God is doing. God is saving souls. God is saving people. God, the same God that was concerned about souls in Nineveh is concerned about souls in America. First Timothy 2 and 4 says this, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Look, what is God doing right now? I know there are a lot of things that are vying for your attention and vying for your focus, but this needs to be number one. The, rev- the revival of our nation the saving of the souls of the people in our city and in our states. And having said all of that, let me just say, for that to happen, the church needs to be united. The church needs to be united. Open church, don't open church. Masks, no masks. Social distance, don't social distance. Conspiracy theory, no conspiracy theory. Look, there are all sorts of things that we can be divided over. But let me tell you today, united we stand, divided we fall, all right? United we stand, divided we fall. We have the freedom to have a different opinion on these things. But at the end of the day, we need to be united around the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, 
Every decision that this church makes is oriented around the advancement of the kingdom of God, period, period. That's it. That's it. Churches right now are fracturing. I see it. I see it with my friends. I see it in our city. And I think the adversary, as he sees that, he is licking his lips. He is licking his lips because that's exactly what he wants. He knows that the thing that is going to hinder the advancement of the gospel the most is division within the body of Christ. And so, look, this, this is, I'll just tell you straight, this is a plea. I am beseeching you. We want to lead you in this. Let's regain our focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's make that number one. Because I'll, I'll tell you this, God is going to move. God is going to move. God doesn't need me, that's for sure. Don't say amen to that, but you can if you want to. God doesn't need me, and God doesn't need you, and God doesn't need Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. God is going to move. The question is, will our hearts be in the right place when he does it? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much, God, that you, you don't quit. You don't give up. You are relentless in the best sense. And Father, we confess that sometimes we're overdramatic. God, sometimes we are choosing disobedience. But we know you. We know you, God. We know your heart for people. You cared about the Ninevites. As wicked as they were, you loved them. And in a day, God, you changed a culture. We won't stop believing that, God. But we want that to be more than just a, a principle that we believe. We want our whole being aligned God, we want to be able to live like David did. We want to make those choices where our lips, our lungs, our hands are consecrated to you. God, not because of law, but because of loving kindness. Father, we ask that, that you would align our church. God, we're so thankful for the community of believers, brothers and sisters in this body of Christ. All we want to do is exalt you and exalt your son and be filled and empowered by your spirit. And so, Father, would you work that work, help us to yield. God, I pray for the heart that's struggling right now, just battling with decisions, choices of obedience. Would you please work in them both to will and to do for your good pleasure? God, would you lead us, as you led the Ninevites to a place of repentance, God, would you lead us to that place today? God, would you bring the restoration? Would you bring the hope? Would you help us to reprioritize God, would you break any chain that has been being formed on our heart? Would you release us from any prison of our own making? For God, we know that your word says where, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Today, as our eyes are closed and as we're just in this moment of prayer, Today, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, and maybe for the first time you've heard that he loved you so much that he was willing to make himself of no reputation. He was willing to suffer the shame of the cross because he cares for you. He loves you. He knows you. And today, he is calling you to come to him that you might be saved. You need salvation. You need the forgiveness of your sins. This is not all that there is to life. There is life after this life. 
And the only way to experience that life with God is by believing in his son. Will you take that step of faith today? Today, if this is you, I want to lead you in a, just a very simple prayer. Listen, I also want to ask maybe for those of you who are Christians, you know that in some sense, in some way, your life is similar to Jonah's. Look, you can identify with them. And today in that way of identification, you know there's something for you to lay down, something for you to turn away from, something for you to repent of. Today there's an opportunity for you to have your heart softened by the loving kindness of God. That you need that new work of his spirit in your life. God has spoken to you today and there's a decision for you to make. And so if this is you today, maybe today you need to put your faith in Christ for the first time. Maybe today as a Christian, there's something that you need to hand over to him for both of you. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. Very simple prayer. A decision, a choice that you make, a turning to God. Not a turning away from him, but a turning to him. And so if this is you today, you know that you need to pray and seek the face of God. God, I want to lead you in this prayer right where you're sitting today. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just stretch your hand up high. I want to see who you are. God bless you and you and you. Thank you so much. God bless you and you. Thank you. In the back, thank you. God bless you guys. If you're in the overflow today, you raise your hand. Please, if you're at home watching online, stretch your hand up high. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Just want to lead all of you in a very simple prayer today, and this is your prayer to God. He has spoken to you already, and unlike Jonah, you're choosing to turn to him, and you're choosing today to, to give him your heart, to turn away from any unbelief, to turn away from any sin. So I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. God, today... I give you my life, all of my life. Father, I'm not holding anything back. Today I'm choosing to believe in your son with all of my heart. Today I'm choosing to turn away from the sin in my life. And I'm asking for your forgiveness and for the filling of your Holy Spirit. God, I give you all of me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you followed in prayer for the very first time, we want to welcome you into the family of God. We're so thankful for what God is doing in your life. Today, if uh, you're a Christian and you've rededicated your life, we're so grateful for that step of faith that you've taken as well. We know that God has great things for you. Um, I want to encourage you in each of our uh, rooms today, we have follow-up uh, individuals, leaders that are going to make sure you have a Bible. They want to pray for you. And I want to just uh, encourage you to uh, give them a minute of your time. If you're watching online today, cclasvegas.org forward slash online. Uh, or, you know, Facebook Live right after the service. Just let us know that you've taken a step of faith and received Christ. We want to make sure you have a Bible as well.